Well, now let's take a look at another approximation technique that we can use. What if I had kind of the same picture shaping up here? I had a value of a and a value of b. And I wanted to start by chopping up this interval a to b into some smaller subintervals. So again, I'll mark on here, maybe I have an x1, an x2, an x3. That makes b x4, and easily then makes a x0. Well, if I want to approximate here, and I want to use trapezoids, I mean, that means I'm going to be using figures that are similar to this yellow trapezoid that I have down here. To create this, I can just go from each one of the edges of an interval up until I hit the function. And watch that once I hit the function here, I can just play connect the dots with a nice straight line between these two points. Now you'll see here that when I drew in that straight line, I now have a nice trapezoid sitting here. And of course, the area under that trapezoid, or inside of it, is going to roughly model the area that's under this curve. In fact, it looks like it's almost doing a near-perfect job, right? Like, I, can, I can't really see any gaps. Although that might just be a result of how I've drawn the picture, the thickness of the pen that I'm using, and how straight my line is. So I'm not going to completely trust the picture for how good the approximation is. But let's see if we can draw the rest of these in. Okay, so now I have this. Again, I'm just drawing each side up until I hit the curve, and then just kind of playing this game of connect the dots. Draw this one straight up, and then playing a game of connect the dots. So each of these different trapezoids that I have here is helping me to approximate the area on a given interval. And so what we would want to do now is to figure out how can I find the area of one of these trapezoids. Right? It's not the same as doing the area of a rectangle. Well, that's what I'm going to go ahead and write down here. I'll start off by saying, first, recall that the area of a trapezoid is given by 1 half base 1 plus base 2 times the height. Okay, so this is typically th uh, what we do when we're finding the area of a trapezoid. We have this kind of summary formula here. The B1s and B2s correspond to the parallel sides. So maybe this would be B1 and this would be B2. Now typically we see um, trapezoids oftentimes with their parallel sides kind of running horizontal on the page, maybe like this. And so it makes sense to call this other side h. Okay, so that's actually going to be my h down there. Even though it doesn't look like a height, um, that's what it's actually going to be here when I kind of turn the figure. And so with all of those individual pieces in place, I can see then how each of these different values might be able to be found with the trapezoids that I have here. I can easily start to see h is going to be equivalent to what in terms of the picture up here. Notice if h is the distance from left to right on the bottom side of the trapezoid, that's like how far is it from a to x1 or x1 to x2? Well, that would actually be the same thing as delta x, the width of the interval. And b1 and b2 can be found by plugging in x values into our function, right? Like if I plugged x number 4, b, into my purple function, that would tell me the, the length of this side. That would get me like a b1. And if I plugged an x3, that could tell me this side up here uh, and how long that would be. So if I kind of put this all together to approximate the figure that I have up above, I could say that the total area up there then is going to be um, roughly equal to, and I could add all these trapezoid areas together. Now I'm going to go ahead and do this just so we can see what it looks like. All right, so let's see. I know that I'm going to have a, uh, let's see, a 1 half and an h every single time. I'm going to go ahead and replace h right away with my delta x, and I'm actually going to put that over the 2, and then write down my two different bases. 
For my first trapezoid, you can see that my bases are going to occur when I plug in x0 and x number 1. So I'm going to have here f of x0 plus f of x1. My next trapezoid is still going to have delta x over 2, but for its bases, I'm going to have to plug in f of x1 and f of x2. I have two more trapezoids to go. So I'm going to have delta x over 2, f of x2, plus f of x3. And now for the last trapezoid, still have my delta x over 2. And here I'm going to do f of x3 plus f of x4. Now I'm going to try to simplify this formula just a little bit because I'll notice that if I have a bunch of items added together, but they all have something in common, it doesn't seem like there's any problem then with taking that common item of delta x over 2 and pulling it out of everything. And if I think about what's left, it's just going to be a whole bunch of f's. But what you'll notice is that a lot of these f's are repeated, right? Like if I wrote some of these down, I could see that I have only a single f of x0 in this whole list, but I actually have two f of x1's, I have two f of x2's, I have two f of x3's, but I only have one f of x4. Now, if you try to generalize what we've done here, you might be able to see very clearly how I would know which items here are going to be getting doubled and which ones are not. And I could also see that I know that no item is ever going to be tripled or quadrupled. Think about it up again, uh, up above in regards to the picture. Notice that I only am going to use f of x1 to determine the length of this side twice because there are two trapezoids that use that side as a base. Whereas at the edges, this side is only ever touched or used by one trapezoid. And so it's these edges that only occur one time and everything in the middle is a shared side of a trapezoid and so will get used multiple times. So we'll be able to go ahead and kind of summarize all of this into what we call the trapezoid rule. So if I was interested in finding area from a to b under a function f of x, I could say this is roughly equal to delta x over 2, and then I would know that I would have an f of x0 plus 2 f of x1s plus 2 f of x 2's and I would kind of just go on and on and on and on and on for a while. Now the very last item I would get would be f of x number n, right? Once I hit my nth rectangle I would stop and I know there's only one of those, or sorry, nth trapezoid I would stop. I know there's only one use of that last side, but I do know that there's two uses of the side that would come right before it, which would happen at x, or f of x n minus 1. So this is what my general formula would look like. Again, I just note that every side that is not the endpoints is going to be getting doubled. Well, we can see how that's going to work down here in example 2. Notice I'm going to work with the exact same curve that I did previously, this e to the negative x squared. Let me go ahead and try to shape up a picture of this again. So, I'm going to have my curve, which goes something like this. I'm going to estimate where negative 1 and positive 1 are in the picture. And I can see again what my n is, so I can start to figure out my delta x. Delta x is going to be, well, let's see, I have an interval of length 2. Chopping it into two pieces gets me 1. I'll also note that the function that I'm working with here is my e to the negative x squared. And so when I start to build these trapezoids, I can see that my first trapezoid is going to have a base, or in this case a height, from negative 1 to 0. I follow the sides up, touch the function, and play connect the dots, I see that I'm going to do a really good job of approximating here, at least based on this picture. Same thing over here, I'm going to play connect the dots. So I can see I have one trapezoid over here, and another trapezoid over there. So I can easily then say that the integral from negative 1 to 1 e to the negative x squared is roughly going to be equal to adding up these two areas. I know again I can take out my delta x over 2 and then just deal with the different heights 
or bases for the, rect uh, for the trapezoids. So I'll have f of negative 1, that's going to have to get used one time. f of 0 is a shared side, so it would get used twice. And f of 1 is just going to be a single side used one time. And I'm done. So now I can just simplify this down a little bit by plugging these numbers into my function. Notice again that we're squaring and then multiplying by the negative. So when I plug in 1 or negative 1, I'm actually going to generate the exact same result. I'm going to get e to the negative 1. In the middle, I'm going to get e to the 0. And so I have something like this. Notice that I can simplify that inside down. I have 2e to the negative 1s. e to the 0 is just 1, so I actually have that as, times, or, uh, as a plus 2. If I distribute the 1 half, I can simplify that down to e to the negative 1 plus 1. And if I went to a calculator to, again, just try to roughly approximate what I was dealing with here, um, again, I'm not going to show it on screen, but I have an approximation of roughly 1.368. Now, typically, remember, I don't often ask you to round things off to uh, decimal places, but in this case, I'm interested in looking at the approximations for the midpoint rule and the trapezoid rule to kind of compare and contrast them and to see maybe which one is doing a better job. So we'll talk more about that in detail in the next video.